Pan-African Review is a platform that challenges assumptions about Africa and a space for introspective perspectives on matters of concern to Africans. Hello and welcome to the Pan-African Review. This is your online spot for African discourse. My name is Mahatma Ulimwengu and for you today we have a very special interview with Boyana Koulibaly. She is the African Language Program Manager at Harvard and we're going to discuss her article titled Operation Springbok, Monusco's Contempt for its Peacekeeping Mandate in the Pan-African Review. If you like this guys, please be sure to like, share and subscribe. Send this to your family and friends and we will be back with Dr. Boyana Koulibaly. On November 3rd, 2023, Monusco announced its decision to collaborate with FARDC in a joint operation whose stated objectives are to stop any desire by the M23 to invade Sake or Goma and defend the civilian population. Can you explain just briefly why this decision is problematic and a blatant disregard of the UN's resolutions and Monusco's own peacekeeping mandates in DRC? Yes, um, MONUSCO was established in 1999 and 2000 by two UN Security Council resolutions um, to monitor the peace process of the Second Congo War. It was it was tasked to support the voluntary disarmament, demobilization, repatriation, reintegration, and resettlement process. Uh, the 2002 Pretoria Accord negotiated with the transitional government led by Joseph Kabila uh, to end the Second World War. Uh, Second Congo War consisted in the withdrawal of Rwandan forces from Eastern Congo and the dismantling of the XFAR or Internal Hamway Forces, today FDLR, in DRC. Uh, since MONUSCO was created two decades ago, uh, the UN Security Council and MONUSCO know that the precondition to peace in Eastern DRC is the dismantling of FDLR and of their other uh, manifestations or forms, whether they're military or political, since they are, in fact, politically the same people who have masterminded the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and who have continued to kill and persecute the Tutsi in the Congo. From 2002 to 2011, despite a plethora of peace initiatives, whether international or regional that were designed to tackle the FDLR presence, none have been implemented by the DRC government, and these efforts have been overlooked by MONUSCO. Mm -hmm. So the decision today with this Operation Springbok is not only pretending like these peace, peace efforts never took place, but it is denying their own mandate, which is support the peace process by dismantling the FDLR which is at the basis of the DRC crisis. And it therefore makes li little logical sense for MONUSCO to begin a joint operation with FRDC, which in fact collaborates with the armed groups that MONUSCO was supposed to help dismantle, which is the reason why, in fact, the M23 has come back to fight. So would you say, is there any doubt that MONUSCO is aware that FRDC is collaborating with these armed groups and these negative forces in the country? No, there is no doubt because all the latest UN Security Council updates on DRC or MONUSCO mandate renewal of resolutions or a group of expert reports, especially since 2019, 2020, which was before the revival of the M23 rebellion, or even DRC government admitting it, have reported on FRDC collaboration with negative forces. For example, the 2022 midterm report of the group of experts details the agreement signed in Pinga in May 2022 between FRDC and the armed group NDCR, uh, led by Guidon Chimirai Mouissa, who is a warlord wanted for violent crimes, of their pictures and videos that are provided or that exist of that meeting. And today we see Guidon Chimirai and his armed group, which is active and powerful in the Eastern DRC, being supported logistically by FRDC. So there's no doubt that they know um, of this. So um, doesn't that make part. them complicit? Um, aren't they de facto fighting alongside um, FDLR and such genocidal groups within um, the DRC? What what's the what's the justification that they give? How are they not blatantly complicit? I mean, MONUSCO has shared a plethora of official communications in the past year and months, reiterating the logistical, financial, intelligence, military, or even training support to FRDC. So being perfectly aware that FRDC supports violent armed groups, including the genocidal group FDLR, like I said before, there is plenty of evidence. So yes, MONUSCO de facto is fighting along those same groups. It was tasked to demobilize or help dismantle since the beginning, and particularly 
the FDLR, which was identified in all the UN reports and by experts and historians as the main driver of violence since the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda and the subsequent consecutive wars in DRC. And also the, the integration of the army reserves called Wazalendo is another form of collaboration with the genocidal group, since ideologically the Wazalendo, as we have seen in numerous videos, are being trained to commit violence and against what they perceive as a Rwandan Tutsi invader and infiltrator. Actually, even the civil society group Lucha, which is led by Fred Bauma, who is a senior fellow at the Congo Research Group and New York University, which was itself identified as a violent group by the UN a group of experts and a group which has openly incited violence against Rwanda funds or even planned those uh, and funded those violent demonstrations we've seen in July 2022, even even Lucha has been um, even the Lucha members have joined uh, Wazalendo uh, group themselves to fight against what they call a Rwandan invader infiltrator. So yes, Monusco de facto indirectly but knowingly supports a genocidal group and therefore condones genocide ideology. Wait, so are there any similar instances where UN peacekeeping forces, whether around Africa or the world, uh, where they cherry pick? which armed groups to disarm and which to tolerate. How could you explain why MONUSCO chooses to single out M23 while stating its intentions to defend territories um, in which all these negative forces enlisted by the DRC government are roaming freely? I mean, there's this habit in a very strange absence of rational deduction that we see also in the in the reports themselves to have stated the issue and its root causes. In this case, the powerful and influential presence of remnants of a group that committed a genocide which killed a million people and, and to have them actually not being identified as the root cause, um, in fact, today, and then going around and saying that the consequence of the issue which is in fact the M23 rebellion, is in fact the cause of the issue. Have I seen this in other instances? Unfortunately, yes, we have seen this in 1994 with the peacekeeping mission Minuar. We had the same presence of a genocidal group, the Inter Hamwe targeted this, the same minority group, the Tutsi, and the same presence of a UN peacekeeping mission, which looked the other way when the minority Tutsi group was being slaughtered by 10,000 per day for 100 days. Um, even the supplies uh, of weapons were were present, as we know today, and and then uh, this this um, this remnants the remnants of the of the genocidal group then led uh, fled into into Zaire and was still supported by by the UN and other agencies. Today, this is typically what happens when the UN Security Council, composed of five permanent members that are world superpowers and who have individual national interests to protect in a given region, um, are actually defending their interests. Uh, DRC, which provides access to the supply chain of minerals that power our Western and global economies and the Green Revolution, is today one of the number one interests of the permanent UN Security Council members, uh, so namely the United States, the UK, France, China, and Russia. Um, so I, I think uh, these individual interests of these countries are also one of the reasons why we are uh, not really paying attention to the causes and we're not, it's not really so much in our interest to solve uh, the, the chaos that is happening there. Yeah, so I, I get that. And obviously, as you've pointed out, it's evident that they um, they failed to follow and implement what their original mandate was. They're not a, a peace building uh, force or campaign what justifications do they offer? What is the explanation? Obviously, you mentioned the international forces, but they can't blatantly say, oh, we are representing these interests from the UN Security Council. So what is the daily reflections from MONUSCO? What's their campaign messaging on the DRC and their repeated failures specifically? In, in fact, no justification is given because the idea oh. is to undermine these peace initiatives because they do right. not respond to the needs of the powerful member states sitting in the UN Security Council. The only justification given is that MONUSCO needs to be present in DRC because of the ongoing instability and insecurity. So singling out M23, which in fact offers a solution to the problem of insecurity DRC is facing today, or since they're currently succeeding in fighting back against the entire DRC armed coalition, is in the logical sequence of MONUSCO wanting to remain in DRC. As long as uh, the M23 you know, dubiously continues to be identified as a security problem, then MONUSCO will continue to pretend to have valid reasons to exist and remain. 
Right. So I'm just going to refer to your article here. Uh, you listed in one of your points. In fact, Springbok encapsulates the overall disregard by MONUSCO for a plethora of agreements and resolutions. One such is the 13th March 2008 resolution in which the council demanded that the FDLR and other such armed groups essentially stop recruiting and using children, release all children associated with them, and hold gender-based violence. So that's the selective implementation of its mandate that you refer to in your article. Now, I just want to talk about the offensive in March 2023. Could you just talk about that specifically, what happened during that action? Yeah, yes, the, the Force Intervention Br Brigade at the time was created to enforce the DDRRR process, which was not effective as a voluntary process, whatever that really meant. That is not- so what's, the, what's the DDRRR? Yeah, so it's the, this disarmament, demobilization, okay. and rehab and etc. So it, it was implemented as a form of voluntary process, but it didn't really work. So the Force Intervention Brigade served to kind of tackle that issue, given that a peacekeeping mission usually does not use offensive forms of intervention. So it was created to tackle the M23 fighters who had at that time no trust in getting justice and who continued to fight for their own rights. But it was created also to dismantle all the other armed groups. So basically to address the insecurity in DRC, with no offensive option or with an offensive option. So we see in the MONUSCO mandate renewal resolutions in the following years after 2013, language which implies that a UN entity with an offensive power is no longer necessary in DRC. So once M23 was dismantled, uh, they, they did not continue to uh, follow their mandate. So, of course, at that time, it was also costly and the largest contributor, like the United States, wanted to discontinue. But it is also because it has not fulfilled its original mission of eradicating insecurity and armed groups. So MONUSCO simply decided to selectively ignore uh, that more insecurity was growing and more armed groups were being uh, created, ending in accusing M23 for their own failure. Hmm. So why do you think, um, through your studies on this issue specifically, why do you think MONUSCO is so indifferent? Uh, obviously, there's the foreign interests aspect of it, but as MONUSCO, as an organization, why are they so publicly and privately indifferent to the Congolese people's lives, uh, particularly to those members of the Tutsi minority who have obviously been targeted and obviously as a result of the genocide in 1994, a lot of that similar uh, hostility is going on in the DRC. Why can they not even feign compassion on this issue? Yes, uh, this is because, as I've said here before, the root cause of violence in DRC is the presence of the genocidal group FDLR, which is right. very powerful politically and ideologically, but also because the DRC government directly supports FDLR, as we've seen, and now openly Tutsi phobia uh, by inviting to Kinshasa and interacting with established genocide deniers and um, ideologues, such as uh, the Cameroonian essays Shalo Nana, or giving full immunity to government officials like uh, Justin Bitaquira, who is a member of parliament and a former prime minister of DRC. Um, and who openly promotes anti-Tutsi xenophobia and incites anti-Tutsi violence. Um, but also we, we've seen since last year, several hate crimes committed against the Congolese Tutsi, including mob lynchings, uh, burning human beings alive, consuming their human flesh. These images have been circulating and the DRC spokesperson even declared uh, last week, um, Patrick Moyayad, that the FRDC Captain uh, Gisore Gabongo Patrick, who was lynched, uh, burned alive and cannibalized last week was killed for his Tutsi facial features. And this is happening across the country, even with the Kodeko, uh, who are targeting the Hema community. Um, MONUSCO has a large presence in Goma, where uh, Gisore Kabongo Patrick was lynched, and in Turi, uh, but they are uh, not intervening. And we also have the presence of Radio Okapi, which is a MONUSCO uh, news outlet, which is present in all these uh, places. And uh, we do not see any reporting on these issues by Radio Capi, such as the lynching that we, we've seen or any other forms of violence against um, the Tutsi. So in my view, this is a form of negrophobia or normalization of xenophobia. So denouncing hate speech like they do without identifying the victim group is a form of complicity while trying to protect itself in case hate speech leads to uh, situations like the one we've seen in 1998 where uh, Congolese these Tutsi were burned alive in Kinshasa and which uh, triggered the Second Congo War. 
Right. So your article came out on November 12th. On Operation Springbok itself, how has the operation itself developed over the past week since your article came out? So we haven't seen any particular uh, actions, whether defensive or offensive. I think um, MONUSCO um, has also been uh, realizing that uh, things are still uh, moving in the in the in the area where M23 is currently, I, I believe, defending itself against all the attacks that they have been um, targeted with. Um, the President Chisakedi also had um, a recent interview where he was having a language of uh, incitement to war. Um, you know, talking about drones that they have, uh, which are offensive. Um, in 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 terms of their um, outreach, and um, I believe that Monusco is is being very cautious about the type of support that they might be providing to a government which um, is inciting to war, uh, rather than really uh, thinking about peace. Uh, given that Monusco's mandate uh, requires a peace negotiation with M twenty three, so would this operation pretty much be a public relations or? Uh, some stint for the public consumption if there is nothing happening, you know, nothing intense happening on the ground. Because the headlines, uh, if you search it up online, you see a bunch of headlines that pretty much say the same thing without too many concrete details. Yes, I, I think it's it's part a little bit of the communications campaign that um, MONUSCO has been engaged in in the past year or so. Ever since the violence against MONUSCO key peacekeepers or MONUSCO as a mission has begun um, or had begun last year, uh, MONUSCO has invested in, in a communications company um, to help them uh, provide a positive image. And therefore, I think a lot of um, a lot of what is happening is is mainly happening at the level of of communications and and the media rather than really on the ground. What is really happening on the ground? We are not necessarily uh, reporting on. Uh, for example, the, um, the M twenty three has just organized um, a press conference, and we don't see any um, international news outlets uh, being there to actually see what is really happening on the ground. So I, I think we're really um, experiencing some type of um, war that is happening at the level of the media and information uh, with a, a great deal of disinformation and misinformation, which doesn't really reflect what's happening on the ground. So it's it's a little bit business as usual, I guess, in the area. Mm. Yeah, so lastly, since um, MONUSCO has just aligned itself uh, steadfastly with the DRC government, despite their disregard of the UN's own resolutions or any agreements that could foster peace, in the country, what are some of the consequences that, that you see manifesting from this attitude from MONUSCO and other peacekeeping forces around not just the DRC, but in East Africa and Africa in general, or the third world, if you may? I, I think we're definitely stalling the peace process. I think that the fact that uh, we are uh, as MONUSCO has been there for, for two decades, not following its own mandate and all the peace agreements that have existed. The fact that we're today targeting the East African community um, engagement in the peace process and asking them to leave. And the fact that DRC is, is not really interested in peace is not something that is going to be effective and positive for the region, but also uh, for the countries who are trying to invest in the different types of, um, I would say, business opportunities that exist um, in the region. I think the Great Lakes uh, region of Africa with the, all the neighboring countries um, surrounding um, DRC, um, it's, it's, it's in everybody's interest for peace to be uh, implemented. And because whether it's the African Union, the, the United Nations system in general, or the regional processes, we've been trying to find solutions. And other than the DRC not trying to comply, everybody else is interested in the peace process. So I think inviting SADC or any other forms of, of uh, peace, I would say peacekeeping intervention, is not really what the problem is. It's it's really forcing uh, the DRC government to start respecting what they, they agreed to, to respect in the first place, but are not anymore today. All right, Dr. Boyana Koulibaly, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a good night. Good day. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Have a good night. <laughs> Cheers. 
thank you very much for sticking with us till the end be sure to check out our website at panafricanreview.com and we will see you guys in the next episode